Luke 9, verses 37 through 43. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, Your faithless and per perverse generation, how, long, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. All were astounded at the greatness of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Thank you, Sam. Pray with me. Thank you for bringing us together, God. Please use this time to give us a deeper sense of who we are and who you want us to be. Amen. Well, it's a big Sunday, as you can see by our program. It's, of course, Confirmant or Confirmation Sunday, Scout Sunday. Uh, for some of us, it's Super Bowl Sunday. Um, but it's also Transfiguration Sunday. And that's a big moment in the life of the church. And I wonder how many of you might be asking yourselves what exactly that is supposed to mean to you. If you ask that question, what is transfiguration? Why should I feel special about it? You're not alone. Transfiguration is a word that does not come up much. It's listed, best as I can tell, after some Google research, in two places. It's listed in our Gospels and in Harry Potter books. Uh, apparently, as an introductory course at Hogwarts, if I hope I'm saying that right, uh, they take a class intro to Transfiguration. We'll have to have somebody brief us on what exactly goes into all that. Um, what you find when you look it up, the definition of Transfiguration is to be um, metamorphosized, to be changed, to be changed physically. And certainly that's part of what happens in the story. Um, for those of you who have taken up Bruce's challenge and are reading through one of the Gospels week after week, um, if you happen to have chosen Luke, you're going to notice that Luke, among any of the other Gospels, has his feet planted firmly on the ground. Luke is the Gospel that, on the Sermon on the Mount, instead of saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, says simply, blessed are the poor. Luke, any time that there's an option of saying something in a colorful way or saying something in a way that's very figurative, he says it very plainly. Luke is the gospel that says, roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty. This is the work that the church must do. And so to have this story of transfiguration, which I didn't ask Sam to read because it's, a, it's an interesting story and I thought I might just paraphrase it. Peter, James, John, Jesus, go to the top of a mountain to pray. As you see happening throughout the Gospels, the disciples get sleepy within what looks like a few minutes. Well, they are knocked out of that sleep. Suddenly, Jesus is walking with Elijah and Moses and talking about what the next part of his ministry will be. That he's heading towards Jerusalem and there he'll meet his death. A cloud comes down, encircles the three speakers, a voice booms out, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. And then the cloud goes away. Peter, by now I guess fully awake, he proposes a uh, capital planning project. He says let's build some shrines. Um, it's bizarre. I mean there's nothing in Luke that's anything like this. Uh, Jesus talking to two dead Old Testament characters and then talking about Jerusalem. It's a strange scene. For those of you who were just released from captivity today, Star Wars is a movie that just came out. Um, I made my son uh, watch parts 4, 5, and 6. You know, the Luke Skywalker, Han Solo group. We ignore the Jar Jar Binks part of the story. But we watched 4, 5, and 6, and I made him watch it over a course of about a week during Christmas holidays. My sister, I mean, excuse me, my daughter went crazy. Every time she heard the music, she just would get angry and run out of the room. 
But we watched that because I wanted him to see the, the, uh, the new one that came out. And so we did that. It was a special moment for me. I think Gray's probably on the fence about whether or not any of that mattered. Um, I mention it for this reason, though. For those of you old enough, you may remember there was a Star Wars holiday special that came on television in between part one and part two. It was the craziest thing you've ever seen. It was about Chewbacca's family. If you remember Chewbacca, he was a tall, hairy, bear-looking thing, a Wookiee. The whole action takes place trying to get Chewbacca home for a holiday. The thing is primarily in Wookiee with no subtitles. So nobody knows what's being said. B. Arthur makes an appearance. Uh, Princess Leia, it is, it is, I'm telling you, if you've seen this thing, it is bizarre. You can't hardly find a copy because uh, George Lucas said that if he had a sledgehammer and a time, he would kill all of them. Um, so why do I mention Star Wars uh, Holiday Special? Well, I'm weird, and so that was the only kind of thought I had about why on earth is transfiguration in the middle of this book. It makes no sense. It does not fit the rest of the story. But what Luke seems to be saying and what Luke is pointing us to is not just this sort of bizarre flashpoint or some bizarre aside. The idea here is, in case you missed it, in case you might be one of those who thinks that Elijah and Moses are more important, in case you are one of those who thinks the prophets prevail, or that the law is the thing that you should follow, God makes an unmistakable pecking order and says, Jesus is above these. And ultimately, that is who you should listen to. That is who you should trust. Some people have called it, and I think it's right, it's a bridge between the Galilean ministry of Jesus and this time, these chapters that lead us into Jerusalem and into the death of Christ. Now, it's an interesting juxtaposition this story of Jesus and transfiguration. He has changed. His face has changed. His clothing has changed. Peter, James, and John have seen this. If you'll notice the passage that Sam just read, 37 and 43, it's only written about a time that takes place a few steps down off the mountain. Almost immediately after the disciples and Jesus come out of this fantastic moment, this moment of real power, they're confronted with a family in crisis. I, know, I hope you heard what Sam said. A man comes out through the crowd screaming, begging, help me, teacher, help me. He also says that he had tried to get help out of the disciples and they could not help him. Some scholars have asked exactly what that meant, whether or not the disciples were not prayed up, maybe they didn't have enough confidence in what was going on. Luke, as the author of Luke often does, takes a different tact. Where Mark sort of really hammers down on the disciples, Luke says, no, this passage is really about the strength of God. And it's really about trusting God more than being critical of the disciples. So, I wonder if uh, any of you happen to remember Johnny Carson and what he did before he hosted The Tonight Show. I, of course, wasn't around for that, but I had a nanny and papa that were Johnny Carson fanatics, so I got kind of a crash course in his life history. One of the things he did before hosting The Tonight Show is host a program called Who Do You Trust? And this show was a complete setup. I mean, anybody who said yes to it was really not being very smart. It was a husband and wife thing. They would go on. It was kind of a precursor to the newlywed game. And in typical 1950s questions, Johnny always started off by asking the husband something. And what he would ask him was, here's the category of questions. Who do you trust? Can I ask you the question, will you get it right, or can I ask your spouse? Can I ask your wife and see if she'll get it right? I have not seen all the episodes. If some of you have seen more of it than I have, I'd like to hear. But here's what I gathered. It was primarily a bunch of husbands kind of being arrogant, kind of being cocky, blundering through the questions, getting it wrong, and then Johnny Carson made fun of them for the rest of the show. It's a bit of a different and kind of silly, I suppose, example, but the concept is, who do you trust? And so, for Luke, I think that's the big question, and I think for us, maybe today, as we look at our confirmands, that's a big question. I know that you guys have been learning about what it means to be people of faith, 
And not just people of faith, but you've put on the stoles now. And the idea is, and the thing that you've all heard, many people in the church, Bruce, your mentors, your parents, other teachers, you are now ministers. And the expectation is that you leave this place and minister. And so, what does it mean? What does it look like? How can we help? I can tell you that the reason I picked that passage today that Sam read, that passage that's a little bit scary, where a dad doesn't know what to do because his son is sick, and where the disciples don't know what to do because they're overwhelmed, I picked that because I think that's a lot closer to what actual ministry looks like than sometimes the happier moments are. And so when you decide to step out and do ministry, it really can be disorienting and scary. You really can be in situations where you feel overwhelmed and don't know what to do and don't know who to call. And so I think what transfiguration gives us that's special is it gives us that reminder that at the end of the day, it's really not up to us. That when we try to go into a situation that's bigger than us, we draw on the one who is bigger than the situation. And that's where our trust is. So the old Johnny Carson question, who y'all are all looking at me sideways, who on earth is Johnny Carson? I mean, let's, just, let's just consider him Jimmy Kimmel for now. Who do you trust is the key question. And the answer is, I trust the one that was on that mountain. The one that can move mountains. The one that's bigger than these moments of crisis. The disciples weren't able to heal the boy. And I would submit to you that a lot of times we are no different than they are. Well, a lot of times, as talented as you all are, and I have to tell you all in this church, if you don't know already, we have a very talented group of young people in this church. Just we are blessed just in a way that doesn't really make sense for our church our size to have the type of talented people we have, particularly in our youth. But I'm telling you, sometimes it just it, it doesn't rise to the moment. Sometimes all of our talents just aren't enough to overwhelm the situation. And that's why this question of trust is such a big one. And this remembrance of the transfiguration can be so important. I shared this a little while ago and y'all didn't fall asleep, so I'll share it again. I spent the last week um, driving across Texas. I, I did some really bad planning um, in terms of work and other responsibilities this week, and I didn't really realize how bad it was till I got about midway through the week. But of course, by then I was committed. I landed in Houston and had to drive to three small little Texas towns about three hours apart and do different things in different towns over there. And um, I realized something about Texas. I guess I knew this before, but you really know it when you get on the highway and you see the billboards and you see the bumper stickers. Texas wants you to remember a lot of things. They, Texas wants you to remember the Alamo, of course. They want you to remember not to mess with them. They want you to remember that they used to be their own independent country. And if you remind them that perhaps you would be okay with them going back to that scenario, they get real touchy about it. Contra, confirmands, we don't want you to re try to fill your head up trying to remember the whole Bible. We want you to study it and make it a daily part of your life. We don't feel like you have to know everything in that book you just read. We want you to study it, commit it to your heart, and make it a process that you know, really fulfills you th throughout the course of your life in ministry. But we do, in the darkest moments, and even now as you start out and begin your ministry, really start to see what it's like to be an active part of this faith and to be an active part of this church. We do want you to trust. We do want you to trust who God is and trust that God can deliver you through things that seem bigger than you are. And I think if you'll do that, I think if you'll remember that, then your ministry is really going to make a huge impact both here and around the, around the world. And so we're grateful for you. We're grateful for this church, for being there for them and supporting them. Let's not forget our commitment to them. And with that, let's go out there and continue our ministry. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for each person here that has been confirmed today and that has decided to take their faith to the next level that has decided to take seriously this challenge that you lay before us of ministry. Help us to be the kind of church that helps them to be the best ministers they can be. Help them to be the kind of ministers that trust in you. We thank you for all the opportunities you give us, 
and are grateful for the gift of your Son. And we pray these things in His name. Amen.